Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long interview program where we invite a guest host to interview the author of a new book. This week, Will Haygood recalls the life of boxer Sugar Ray Robinson in Sweet Thunder. Born Walker Smith, Jr., the future title holder spent his formative years in Harlem and mixed his pugilistic career with the happenings of the Harlem Renaissance. Mr. Haygood recounts Sugar Ray's connections to Langston Hughes, Miles Davis, and Lena Horne, a generation of African Americans who found success in their respective fields during the start of a broader civil rights movement. Will Haygood discusses his book with Dave Zirin, sports columnist for The Nation magazine and author of A People's History of Sports in the United States. Welcome to Afterwards. I'm Dave Zirin. I'm the sports editor for The Nation magazine, and I'm absolutely, be, absolutely thrilled to be interviewing a man who has written a tremendous biography about the greatest pound-for-pound -pound boxer of the 20th century. That boxer's name is Walt Walker Smith, Jr., better known as Sugar Ray Robinson, and the author is Will Haywood. Will, how you doing, sir? I'm good. Good. Good to be here. It's great to have you. Now, I really do think this book is actually worthy of Sugar Ray Robinson. It's a tremendous achievement, so congratulations right away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, you are not a sports biographer by trade. Right. No, Why not. did you decide to spend five years of your life writing about Sugar Ray Robinson? Well, I had uh, written two previous biographies, one of Adam Clayton Powell, the New York congressman, and the other of the entertainer, Sammy Davis, Jr. So I started thinking, if I could find another subject that interested me, I'd have a trilogy, three major biographies. And I wanted uh, Adam Powell, of course, a politician, Sammy Davis, Jr., entertainer. I wanted a sports figure, but I wanted an athlete who transcended their sport and someone who had a life as fascinating in the ring, because we're talking about a boxer, he had equally a fascinating life outside of the ring, and I wanted somebody you know, who was known but still had a lot of mystery around his life, and that that figure for me was Sugar Ray Robinson. Absolutely. I mean, I think he is one of the most underwritten about boxers of the 20th century, particularly considering that every major boxing writer would consider him to have that title of greatest pound for pound fighter of the 20th century. Right. Which is qu quite a title to have, actually. Yes, it is. Now, it seems to me that there are a lot of very interesting common threads between the people you focused on in your, in your bi biographical career. Uh -huh. uh, Adam Clayton Powell, Sammy Davis Jr., Sugar Ray Robinson. I see some very interesting common threads there, and I don't just mean their appropriation of a very smooth conch hairstyle. Right. I see three people who, who challenged, you could say maybe challenged institutional racism with a great deal of style and personal flair. What do you think about when you think of these three men? What, what sort of common threads do you see that attracted you to their stories? Well, um, they all were, you know, in their own way, uh, fighters. They all were fighters. They all were uh, hungry, hungry for success. Uh, they all um, had um, uh, Harlem roots uh, mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, Adam Powell uh, more so than the other two, but both of them, I mean, all three of them lived in Harlem, and so they all sort of sifted some of the smoke from the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And so each, each man had a sense of, uh, of poetry, of music, of style, of grace, and, and I think that infused uh, their respective lives. Uh, uh, I think uh, music was important to all three, and I think all three sort of achieved a great deal of notoriety in the so-called quiet 1950s. Mm. 
Do you think it's fair to say that all three also represent archetypes that aren't normally talked about in terms of uh, race history or popular culture, that idea of being caught somewhere between the ideals of the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and the ideals of the Harlem Renaissance or the ideals of Booker T. Washington, like you make it on the basis of your own individual greatness and the ideals of seeing some sort of collective responsibility. I, I, I keep thinking of the three of them as belonging in that kind of uh, almost a middle passage, if you were, between two eras. Yes, and they were, and that's a great observation. Uh, and I think because they were caught between those two eras before the 1964 Civil Rights Act, they were already engaged in their own civil rights, mm -hmm. personal civil rights. And I think that uh, they all three uh, had sort of a hell-bent uh, energy uh, uh, to make themselves successful against the backdrop of segregation mm -hmm. in America. And I think that they thought if they could fight, fight their way into the headlines, uh, Adam Clayton Powell in church politics around America, in the U.S. Congress, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, nightclubs in the 1940s, 50s, and then Sugar Ray Robinson as a, uh, uh, as a pure championship athlete. And I think we're very bad at teaching history in this country. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the civil rights movement is taught as if it sprung fully formed from the head of Dr. King in the mid-1950s. Right. As right. if there wasn't groundwork laid before then. Right. And in all three men as well, you see evidence of that groundwork. And the idea of we're going to challenge racism in ways that maybe will inspire people and in the law of unintended consequences, if you will. Right. And about to take it to Sugar Ray Robinson, you have this brilliant chapter in the book about his experience in the U.S. Army. Yes. And comparing and contrasting his demeanor as, I believe, a corporal right. in the U.S. Army with the experience of his sort of running buddy, Joe Lewis. Right. Right. Can you speak a little bit about Sugar Ray Robinson's army experience? I mean, he was still a young fighter at the time, but, but very famous. Yes. What was his experience in the army, and how did he, to, for lack of a better term, buck convention? Yes, it was a fascinating uh, experiment. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt wanted uh, to convey to the American people that, that there can exist racial harmony on U.S. army bases. And so uh, she came up with the plan, her and the Secretary of the Army, to have two high-profile blacks go around to U.S. Army bases and engage in physical training for the soldiers. Uh, uh, the first person she picked was the heavyweight champion of the world, Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis had a young cat who was a friend of his, uh, who he had known, uh, who had uh, actually rowed in a boat, uh, Joe Lewis and his girlfriend, Lena Horn. Uh, and the person who was rowing the boat was uh, young Sugar Ray Robinson. And so anyway, the war comes, there are riots in southern cities uh, of blacks who, who, who say that they're being asked to go to war and die, but they can't get equal treatment in the U.S. And so Fighting this, for democracy abroad, but being treated terribly in the very army bases where they're being home. trained right, to right, fight. Right, right. And so Joe Lewis and Sugar Ray Robinson lead this uh, physical, physical training troop from army base in the army base. Up north on the army bases, they're fine. Everything mm -hmm. goes okay. But then they get below the Mason-Dixon line, Alabama and Mississippi, and that's when all hell breaks loose. Um, one day, uh, Joe Lewis is using a telephone on an uh, army base in Alabama. A white officer, a white guard tells him that he should be at the phone booth for black soldiers. The, uh, Lewis gets upset. Uh, young Sugar Ray Robinson, known as Walker Smith in the army, uh, thinks that the officer is going to hit Joe Lewis. Uh, and 
Sugar Ray, like a panther, jumps on the white army guard, and there is a, a tussle. Now, why anybody would want to tangle with Joe Lewis and right. Sugar Ray Robinson on an army base is unimaginable. Well, it's